So we'll be talking to Bonnie on Wednesday. So make it a priority to be here. And then um, on Tuesday the 16th, which is this Tuesday, right? This is the 14th. I guess I should know that, right? So this Tuesday, the 16th, we'll be having our ladies' Bible study starting up again. So that'll be here at 6.45. If you have questions, you can ask Bethany about that. And then lastly, I noticed that the cleaning list has been quite full. In fact, uh, it's been signed up every week so far until March the 6th. Uh, so it's an opportunity to, to sign up and keep that streak alive. You know, we always say that we want to serve the Lord. Well, this is one way to do it. So thanks for doing that, and I encourage us all to continue. Thank you. Good morning. Worship is ascribing worship to God. We praise him for who he is and for what he does. That is his person, his attributes, and his works. The three uh, hymns that I picked up this morning focus on uh, certain of his attributes that are worthy of our adoration and praise. So if you would turn to uh, hymn number 70, this first uh, uh, hymn, Holy, 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 and of course this is a uh, uh, based on uh, Isaiah 6. I think of uh, uh, Isaiah having this vision of God on his majestic throne, throne in glory, and the angels are surrounding, uh, chanting this phrase 24-7. Uh, and uh, uh, Revelation 4, 8 is a parallel verse uh, to this, but God is holy in uh, all that he is. He is holy in his, his uh, love, his power is holy, his, his wisdom is holy. And the fact that this is repeated three times may be a reference to his triunity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is holy, the Son is holy. Spirit is holy. We see this alluded to in the last part of verse one. But let us stand and sing uh, and ascribe praise to God for his holiness. Hymn number 70.
guess I did that. Uh, then last Wednesday, we were able to hear from our missionary uh, of the month, the Stuttered, and they happen to be our missionary for this week as well. Uh, heard from Randy, and uh, looking forward to hearing from Bonnie uh, this Wednesday. So if you weren't able to join us, make a plan to be here. Uh, Randy had asked us to pray about uh, difficulty they're having over in England getting settled in with their, they, they can't get a bank account. And it's, um, it's been a hard thing to get hold of people to be able to set it up. We uh, emailed me Friday and just, just praising God that they got one set up. So they have their bank account and we were praying for them for that. So that was good. Uh, just keep praying for them as they settle in. A lot of the, their restrictions are a lot harder over in England. So keep praying for them. Um, I believe we have some pictures to put up here behind me for their house that they, they're able to get. He, uh, he posted a picture of the front and their view out the back, and the view was great. So they, uh, they're really thankful for this home they got, had everything they needed. And they, he just asked that we pray for them to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. They want to make contacts, they want to build redemptive relationships, and they want to share the gospel. So they're having a hard time doing it because of the lockdown, but they've been, they've been able to make some headway with people. So... Just keep praying for the, the stutters as they try to, to build those relationships. Oh. Y'all join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you, Lord, for letting us all get up to see another beautiful day today and watching God over each and every one of us, Lord. <clears throat> be with God to lead his spirit amongst us in our hearts and help us to all be faithful. Every time the doors are open, Lord, help us to be faithful witness to you as we're out in our mission field, Lord, and be with uh, us to help each other, reach out to each other, and pray for each other, be with the pastor and his family, Lord, as he brings the message today, be with the uh, Wagner family, Lord, be with Pete and the music and all the good things they do, and be with each and every one of us, all the good things that we all do, Lord. Be with the Al and Jim as the truckers out on the road to protect them and all the truckers that are out there, Lord, and help them to, to come to know Christ as their personal Savior. Be with the, the missionaries we support and we don't support. Be with Randy and Bonnie as the pastors spoke about, Lord, help them meet each and every one of their needs and help them to, to have a good, uh, encourage people and uh, witness to them. And get people saved, Lord, to come to know Christ as their Savior. Be with all of us who's sick and hurting here in church. And we all have problems, Lord, and no problems that you can't do. And be with Dave Dotson. Be with Eula and the Tuleys. Be with Annie. Be with Wayne where he fell this morning and nothing seriously wrong with him. And be with anyone who has fallen that we don't know about in this ice, Lord. Be with uh, Gene and Martha and Vicki. Be with Larry and Kathy Feltner, Lord, and all of us, whoever, the names I haven't even mentioned. We all have needs and problems, and there ain't one problem you can't solve. But thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn, Hymn 40, focuses on God's faithfulness. I'm not faithful. We're not faithful. We fail in many ways, don't we? But we can depend upon God. He is always faithful. He's always, he's dependable. We can look to him, we can trust in him, and this is a wonderful uh, boon to us, particularly in times of uncertainty, uh, that we can trust in God, and he will care for us, and he will uh, bless us, even through negative circumstances. We can remain seated as we worship God for his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you. 
to celebrate love. Love is from God. And if you have your bulletin, I encourage you just to read that verse on 1 Corinthians 13. Um, love hopes all things, endures all things. You look at that list, 1 Corinthians 13, and there's a lot to love. There's a lot that God has manifested for us that is beautiful, incredible, and that he shares that in our hearts and we can show it to each other is a beautiful thing. And I'm very thankful for God's love for us and the love we have for one another. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 7. Please stand as we read scripture together, Acts 7, verses 51 through 60. And as we read, this is Stephen speaking to the Pharisees, the unbelieving leaders in Israel. So as I come out and say, you stiff-necked people, I'm not talking to you. So let's begin reading. Acts 7, verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness 
lay down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Please remain standing for the next hymn. Pete has just uh, mentioned the third attribute of God that we will focus on in this hymn, God's love. And here's the wonder of wonders. How could God love someone like me, someone like you, someone like us, unclean, uh, rebellious sinners? And this is uh, what is brought out in this first verse here. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Yet God chose to set his love on you and, and save you and bring him to bring you to himself through the work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our Savior gave himself for you so that now you find yourself in a position of Sonship to God, part of God's family, having eternal life. What a wonderful thing. Our Savior's love. Let's, uh, from the heart, praise God for his love to you. Uh, we'll sing the first, second, fourth, and fifth verses, leaving out the third, starting in verse one here. See if I get that same uh, welcome that Pete got when he came up here. That was good. I enjoyed that one. Pete, did you even hear it? Okay. <laughs> For those who are on the video, that'll probably drive you crazy. One of the little ones said, Papa. 
because he came up, so it was good. He had a really good, in my opinion, men's breakfast yesterday. Had about seven with us, and just the whole the food is always good, but the, uh, the conversation, the challenge was was very profitable. And uh, if you missed it, I encourage you make your plans to be there next time. It's going to be usually the second Saturday of every month. It was, it was a good time. Put it on your calendars. Uh, March 13th will be our next one. And one more thing is coming up uh, that I'm considering as a training session for discipleship. Uh, it's going to be a, probably a couple of nights away. But if you're interested in attending, I'll be more than happy to take you. We will uh, just take care of you getting up there, et cetera. But um, if you're interested in that, please talk to me, pull me aside, and we will see what we can do to, to get as many into this as we can. So it'd be a good thing. All right, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. You ever been in a you're right. I forgot. It was on my list. Uh, Rob, introduce your guest for us. Thank you. Literally, huh? Yeah. Amen. It's good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll go ahead and volunteer them for when you come back through. You can stay again. At their house, you're welcome anytime. So, if anyone is needing a handout, uh, this is the time to get them because within a very few minutes, we're gonna be catching up on some notes. So go ahead and put your hand up if you need one of the handouts, it's the same as last week's. We'll be finishing up this time. Um, girls, if we could get another, how many more do we need? We can get some more made. Anyone need a handout? No one? Okay. Acts chapter 7. Have you been in a conversation with somebody? And this, this can go wrong. So my illustration is going to break down. I get it. But have you ever been in a conversation and, and somebody is saying something to you and you know what they're thinking? You know where they're coming from. You know what's coming at you, especially if somebody is upset with you. You know what's going to come. You can. Now, I, I've been accused of this, and this is where it breaks down. Sometimes somebody will be talking to me, and I'll be thinking of what they're saying. My eyebrows do like this, and I'm accused of being, of, of being angry with them. And I'm not angry. I'm listening. I'm paying attention, and my face does weird things. Sometimes this illustration breaks down, but there are times when you know this person is livid with me. I'm about to get an earful. We know what's coming. The example that we started last week with Stephen. Stephen is giving these guys this, we'll call it this history lesson, but I, I'm going to say that during that time that Stephen was talking to them and defending himself, we're told what he said, but we cannot see anything that's happening around him. I'm going to suggest to you that Stephen could see it. And he could see this general atmosphere of these people who are getting more and more angry. They're ready to kill this man, literally. They are getting themselves in a position where they can murder Stephen in the exact way they murdered Jesus. This is what they're looking to. So let's go back a little bit. Last week, we looked at 50 verses. I think that's a record for us. But we looked at these verses and we saw Stephen's defense of these charges that have been leveled against him. If you remember, they said, 
uh, Stephen, you are guilty of blaspheming Moses. You're guilty of blaspheming the law. You're guilty of blaspheming the temple. You blaspheme God himself. You are a blasphemer, and according to our law, you should die for your blasphemy. And the, the, this was not one of these charges where they're saying, brother, we care about you. And we want you to repent. They're after Stephen in the same way that they're after Jesus. Those are some of the same charges that they brought against our Lord. And they end up, ended up killing Jesus for those charges, for this blasphemy. So Stephen goes through these 50 verses. And Stephen makes it exceptionally clear that he, using their history, he makes it clear that he is not guilty of their charges. He shows total admiration, total reverence. He shows this for Moses, for the law, for God, for the temple. He does all of this. He does a good job of defending himself. So let's go ahead at this point and review those points that we went over last time. And then we'll start looking at our new text. You can catch up on the, the handouts here. First thing we looked at was Stephen's defense. That was point one. And, and what Stephen did was Stephen appealed to the revelation that he had. Stephen used the Old Testament. He used what Jesus said. He used what the apostles are saying. He used everything at his disposal in order to be able to communicate truth to these unbelieving Jews. He used the revelation he had. Now today, we can use the New Testament as well. And I'm thankful for that. We have these things recorded for us. But here's the point. Stephen knew his Bible. Stephen knew what he had at his disposal, and he used it very, very well, very adaptly. He used it to communicate truth to those who were, who were hearing, and that's a challenge for us. You and I have the privilege of having this complete word of God, and we need to use it. We need, and, and that implies something. I can't use this book if I don't know this book, and here's the problem. We live very much, very much, we live in an age, in a culture of ease, in a culture of comfort. And if it goes, if, if something is uncomfortable for me, I'm, I don't have to do it. If something is going to make me exert myself, I can't have that. I just, I don't have to. We live in this culture where everything is meant to be all about me. And it's all easy. Do you see how much this flies in the face of serving God? It's not supposed to be easy all the time. We need to step up, step out, and we need to get busy serving our Lord. It's not about number one. Unfortunately, that mindset carries over to how we view the Word of God. We have, just, just think through your own day. I would say everyone in this room right now has some free time during their day. We choose what we're going to do with our time. So when I hear the excuse, I just don't have time to read my Bible. Can I just submit to you, you're lying to yourself. You don't make time to read your Bible. That's why I don't read mine when I know I should at times. I just don't make the time. Stephen was good at this. He knew his Bible. Okay, let's go to his points. First thing he talked about was Abraham. Abraham. Abraham lived by faith. We saw that last time. And uh, I'm going to summarize these quick. With Abraham, what, he, what we got down to as far as for us is that we need to live with eternity in view. We need to stop living so much for the here and now and what this life has to offer because these things are just fleeting. We need to live with eternity in view, with what God has to offer and what he desires for us. Then we moved on to Joseph. Joseph was, God exalted him, but his own family rejected him. Joseph was rejected. That's what happens with Joseph. That's what happens with Moses. We end up having the deliverers that God sends the children of Israel reject them. And we looked at this one at the, uh, towards the end of this section, and we saw that God, even with Joseph's case, he is able to work things together for good, even when other people intended for evil in our lives. God can do this, and he's good at doing this. Our key, what we need to do is what we see really in the life of Joseph, we need to stay faithful to him. 
regardless of what we go through, it doesn't matter in that, in that sense, it doesn't matter what you go through. We need to be faithful. We need to stay faithful to our God. And again, I would suggest this is an area where our culture of ease and our culture of comfort, these, these contradict each other. Because if we're going to be faithful, it doesn't always go with what is easy and what is comfortable in our lives. Joseph was a good example for us. Then we move to Moses. Moses uh, left royalty. He forsook royalty in order to serve God, to save his people. He was willing to push aside the blessings of this life, and that is a challenge. And what Stephen what was emphasizing to the people as, they, as, as he described how the people rejected Moses, how they, re, they rejected the law, he was saying, you rejected all of this. You chose your sin despite the fact that Moses gave you proof. Moses came in showing miracles. Moses brought the law to them. Moses did all of this, and he gave you proof. And you still rejected him. And isn't that exactly what happened with Jesus? Miracles upon miracles, proof that he was the promised Messiah, and they still rejected him. So there's a lot of similarities between Moses and Jesus. And the sad thing was, God allowed, even after, our God is a long-suffering God, but there is a point to where the children of Israel rejected him, and God turned them over. He let them go. He gave them up to their own devices. It's a Romans 1 type situation, but that is what happened. That's what Stephen has been pushing with, with, with the Jews here, the Jewish leaders. So as we think on what our Lord has done for us, as we think on, his, on the gospel and how he has blessed us, people, we need to be grateful to him. We need to appreciate what our God has done and stop being so self-centered, so caring about our comforts, we need to be grateful for what he's done. And here's what will happen. As you and I are grateful to our Lord, as we, as we appreciate what he's done, we're going to find that it is so much easier to submit to the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. It is so much easier to obey the word of God. That's what gratefulness does for us. And the opposite is true. As I find that I'm not being obedient, I'm not very grateful for what my Lord has done. And I'm showing that through my life. So as you and I actively disobey God, as we choose to go against what God has set for us to do, and we do our own thing, it is a form of idolatry. And we need to ask forgiveness for that. We need to repent of this. Then he moved on to David, as an example. If you look at David's life, there, there was a lot of problems in there. David sinned grievously, and God still used that man. God loved him and forgave him and restored him. Our God is a gracious God. But he emphasized here in, in the life of David, where David, the, the, God had given the, Moses the, the, the pattern for the tabernacle. This is what I want you to build. This is how you are going to worship me. This is, going, this is where I'm going to show myself to you. And they, in a sense, rejected that. That wasn't good enough. And David wanted more. He wanted to build this structure, the temple, for God. God said, no, Solomon can do it. Now, he was making, he was not saying at all he was against the temple. But he was making a point to show them you had something. You got something bigger and better. You got this great thing. And you end up worshiping that instead of worshiping God. And isn't that what people do today? We end up going from, instead of, instead of let's worship God, we'll worship, really, we'll worship this building sometimes. How do we do that? Can't do that in church. I'm in church. This is where I meet God. This is this better not be the only place you meet God. That's a scary thing if this is the only place you can come to meet your Lord. Because that means the Lord's indwelling us if we're his children. He's with you 24-7. Our worship should not just happen here. It should happen all the time because he's constantly with us. We're constantly in his presence. 
So they were trusting in the temple. And the temple had become an idol. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to confine our worship here to the church. This is not where our worship happens. If you're a follower of Jesus, we need to be worshiping him 24-7. So, that being said, Stephen has made very clear that their charges against him, they're bogus. He was not guilty of disobeying and blaspheming any form of their religion. Stephen is using their history to show the Jewish leaders his innocence. He also uses their history to show them that they are the ones who have disregarded the prophets. They're the ones who have disregarded the law. They're the ones who have blasphemed God by killing those prophets, and he's making it so clear. He's showing them through this criticism of their ancestors that they are just as guilty. And this was a part of the history that the, even to this day, Jews don't like to discuss these things. Jews don't like to look back and say, yeah, we, our ancestors were scoundrels. Our ancestors were horrible, and they don't like to bring it up. And, the, and we'll see this in a minute. The time they do bring it up is usually to say, we would never have done that if we had been back in those days. Yes, they would. They would have been just as guilty. So they don't like bringing this up. And Stephen, in a sense, you might say, he throws it in their face. In today's text, I noticed when he started reading this, it was, you know, okay, I'm not saying this against you. This is a blunt place to start. And it is a very blunt passage. That's where he starts today. It's kind of like, here's your overview, and now it's application time. And he's going to bring it all home. He's going to bring it all to a point. And he addresses their sin issue. Stephen knew he was going to be found guilty. The fact that the charges are the same thing they killed his Lord for, he can see the handwriting on the wall. He can tell where this thing is going. And so he's gonna, he uses his message. He uses this whole thing in order to point out their sin point them to Jesus, show them that Jesus is Messiah. He's using this to glorify God. And as direct as this passage gets, as, as hard hitting, if you will, that Stephen is, I want to suggest to you that what God is doing through this message is he's giving these unrepentant Sanhedrin one more opportunity to repent. We are again seeing the grace of God. And I'm not sure if Stephen, during, while we're reading these next few verses, I don't know if he actually got to finish or if they interrupted it. We can't really tell. But we're going to see here Stephen get very blunt and very personal with these accusations. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at our new text. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. Thank you for being gracious to us. Help us to be serious-minded about you, Lord, as, as we just reviewed. Help us not to be so concerned about our own convenience and comfort that we allow that to run our lives. Lord, help us to be sold out to you. I pray as we look into this passage that you would Give us understanding. I ask for, that you would allow your spirit to, to work in a very real and decisive way in each one of our lives. Help us to be responsive to him. Lord, please help my words to be accurate. Keep me from error as I preach. And I pray that in some way you would be glorified by our efforts here today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Point number two. Stephen's denunciation. Stephen's denunciation. This is going to take us verses 51 through 53. And in these verses, Stephen, he's getting to this application. So he has been showing their ancestors that, that they have been guilty. They rejected God. They rejected his word. And he's showing everything that he's been saying has been in the third person. They did this. They did this. Our fathers did this. Everything is about somewhere else. And now, as you look at verse 51, he starts out with you. 
you're the ones who are doing this. You're the ones that have this problem. So now it's getting much more pointed and much more personal. And again, he can see their reactions. He can tell how upset they've been getting. And given the, 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 what, the sudden turn into this attack mode, if you will, I would say they've been getting very antsy. And they're ready to attack. So he makes his point even, even more clear. So the first thing we see is there was no relationship. There was no relationship. Verse number 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. You sinned against the Holy Ghost. That's, that's the, the, the gist of this verse. He says you're stiff-necked. You're a stubborn people. And this is, a, this is a bad thing for us today. So keep this in mind. They were unteachable. They would not respond when God would teach. They would not respond to the teaching of the word of God. They were obstinate. And this attitude that they're having, that Stephen is accusing them of, this is their attitude before God. This is how they're reacting when God is showing them something. This is a serious charge. They needed to be teachable. So they're, you're stiff-necked and you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. This is extremely strong language to the Jews. If somebody said that to you today, it may not mean too much. Here, what this phrasing has the idea of is you've never been forgiven. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. You have got a spiritual problem. You are as unclean, when we use that phrase, uncircumcised, you're as unclean as the Gentiles. These are fighting words. These are words that would have got these men extremely upset. Today, we might use the word from Ephesians 2.1, you're dead in your sins. That is what Stephen is accusing these men up. So you're unclean in heart, you're unclean in your ear, uncircumcised in your ears. You won't listen to the truth. And he's probably referring back to the passage in Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, that says this circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff necked. Okay, that, that verse, that comes right after that. He's saying that to them after they rejected Moses, after they rejected the law, when they made the golden calf. He said, stop being this way. Stop being so stubborn and stop acting like unsaved people. And most of them were. So they did this. Here, here, here's Stephen's point. People, you blew it. You blew it. So stop being so stubborn. You want to come up here with me? Come on. It's all right. You can probably do a better job. Bring him on. This will be good. So he's telling these people, stop being so stubborn. And this word that we have here, where he, where the, this, you who always resist, stop resisting. The picture of it is when you're trying to lead an animal. And now I picture it with, you know, like a cow. You ever tried to get a cow with a rope and get that cow to go somewhere it didn't want to go? I mean, you can hook it to a tractor and do what you want to do, but you're not pulling that cow with your hands if that cow doesn't want to go somewhere. We've got these little 20 pound dots and it, you got to pull them sometimes. These animals can get very stubborn. That's the picture of this word, resist. It's a large animal that plants itself and it's not going anywhere. You do always resist. You're like one of these animals that doesn't want to follow God. You've rejected Joseph. You rejected Moses. You've rejected the tabernacle. You've rejected all of this. And now, you Sanhedrin, you've rejected the Messiah. You don't have a relationship with Messiah. You have this pattern, which they did, and I'll say which we do at times. You've rejected God's deliverance for your life. And they tried to put their own method of deliverance, their own mentality. They weren't teachable. So they pushed aside what God has provided. And I will say this, at least, at least their ancestors, when they had try number two with Joseph, remember his brothers, when they had another opportunity to repent and go after Moses, at least on the second try, they did it. 
The Sanhedrin here had multiple opportunities and they just dug in their heels. They continued to reject God. They continued to reject his Messiah. So they're worse than their fathers. That's the point that Stephen is pushing. What they had was an outward religion. They had outward religious activity, but they did not have an inward reality. You understand that? They had outward religious activity, but no inward reality. Do you realize that is exactly what's going on in most churches today? Do you realize that's what's going on in a lot of Bible preaching churches today? There's a lot of religious activity, but there's, there's no inward reality. Maybe it's somebody here today. We have got to have, there's got to be a point where you and I stop that resisting, that digging in our heels, and we submit to God. There has to be a time when you have been forgiven because you do not, you're not born forgiven. You're born guilty. And there has to be a time when we enter that relationship with Christ. A church doesn't do it for you. Parents don't do it for you. We must be forgiven. And Christians, you and I, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can, we, we can grieve him as we refuse to submit to God's ways. There may be a relationship there. Maybe you've entered into salvation, but that fellowship can get broken. And we need to be like David. We need to, you know, God restore to me the joy of my salvation. We need to repent, and we need to repent often. Let's go to our next one, the repeating of sin, verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you, you have been now the betrayers and murderers. So they sin not only uh, against the Holy Ghost, they've sinned against the Messiah. So which of the prophets? And what's implied with that is all of them. So which one of them didn't you do this to? You did it to all of the prophets. You persecuted them and are killed them. Now we know if you go, you don't need to turn there for sake of time, but Matthew 23, 30, that's when some of the Jews had said this. They were, they were cleaning up the tombs, making everything look good. And they said, oh, if we had been back then, we would never have done this to the prophets. We honor the prophets. And they were just busy patting themselves on the back. And you know what? These are the same ones that are patting themselves on the back. That No, they, they didn't kill the prophets. They did worse. They killed the Messiah that the prophets were talking about. So they are guilty of killing Jesus. Second Chronicles. 36.15 says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up the times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. So he kept sending the prophets, but they mocked the messengers of God. And they despised his words. They misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. There's a point that came where God says, enough is enough, you're done. And it was a very, and God allowed them to go into servitude. He turned, for, he turned his presence from them. These were rough uh, consequences that these Jews had to pay. So the Old Testament Jews, they were brutal. They were stubborn people. And now these Jews in Jesus' day, they're just as bad. They have killed. Notice the phrasing he uses. You've betrayed and murdered the just one, the righteous one. He's looking back to, to Isaiah 53. We know that passage regarding Messiah. Isaiah 53, 11 talks about the righteous one. And what Stephen is doing is he is emphasizing the innocence of the Messiah and the guilt of the people. You have killed. It's not just that you killed someone. You killed the just one. You killed the Messiah. And the word betray, we may think, well, no, they didn't really betray him. But what did they do? They used Judas. Had him betrayed. And then they turned him over to the Romans. And then the Romans killed him. They're the ones who were guilty. 
The part that amazes me with this is I think about Jesus allowing himself to be given over, and he knew it was coming. He knew what was happening, and he let them do this. Jesus did this out of his love and out of his compassion for you and me. While we were still in our sins, he loved us like this. He died for us while we were hating him. That should give us an appreciation for the price that he was willing to pay on our behalf. Now, that sin that they did, where they betrayed the Messiah, that can't happen again. Jesus is gone. He's died once. He's risen from the dead. We can't commit that specific sin. But we need to be careful that we are not repeating the sins of our ancestors. That we are not turning on our Lord. That we are not betraying him in our lives. We make sure that we're living for him. We're being faithful to him. Let's move on to verse 53. The rejection of the law. The rejection of the law. Verse 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So the who. He's talking about them. You have received this law. You, the ones who murdered the Messiah, the ones who betrayed the Messiah, and he's showing here their blasphemy against God. You have received the law. God worked in a miraculous way to give them the word of God. God entrusted them. You realize that God gave, he, he gave the Old Testament Jews the word of God with the express purpose that they were to obey that book and they were to be a light with that book to us Gentiles. They were to go out and do this. They blew it. They rejected the word. They rejected the God of the word. They received it according to this, the first part of this verse. But the end of it, you've not kept it. You have, and the word has the idea of to watch something, to guard something. It implies an attitude towards something that is special that results in obedience. And he says, you guys have not kept this book. You haven't honored this book. If you and I treasure the word of God, if you and I make this something that is, that it, that is precious to us, the obedience will follow. The problem we have is we see this book you often in church circles, this book is a good thing. The Bible is a good thing, but it's not a passion. It's not something that we are sold out to follow. And when it is not a passion, we're often, and this is what we see in the church today, we have an obedience of convenience. When it's a convenient thing for me, I will obey this book. When it's not convenient for me, when it does not further what I want to do, what I want to accomplish, I'm going to push this book aside and I'll make excuses for why I don't need to obey this book. And obedience of convenience is sinful. And you and I need to make sure that that is not what we are practicing. Now, obviously, to reject the Savior, to reject Jesus, is to reject the word. And that has eternal consequences to it. If you've never received Jesus as Savior, it is not something you kind of morph into. You don't just grow into this. There's a point where you are unsaved. You call on the Lord, and he forgives you. He redeems you. He makes you a new creature. If that hasn't happened, I'm just, you've rejected Jesus. It doesn't matter how good you've lived. You've rejected Jesus. But too often, Christians... We can allow self, we can allow our culture to become more influential in our lives than the Word of God. What is it that dictates what you do? Are you more dictated by the stuff around you and how people respond to you and what's going to advance you and make you feel good? Are you more interested in what God says and following Him? People, we we need to get on our knees regularly. We need to ask God to, to restore unto us the joy of our salvation. We need to ask him to renew this relationship in us. It's a need. And he can do this. It's a prayer that glorifies him and he'll honor that. Let's 
look at our last one, Stephen's death. Stephen's death. Now, at this point, Stephen has made some very, very direct and harsh claims. At this point, the leaders can't take it anymore. The leaders, their sin's been pointed out, and they can't refute it. So since they can't refute it, when you can't fix the problem, just attack the person. And that's what they're going to do. We see in these verses their desperation. They're going to attack, literally, Stephen. So first point, the Jews' rage. The Jews' rage. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Okay, this verse is one of contrast. Because what, what we have in this, you've got a spirit-filled man being Stephen. And now we're going to see this hate-filled mob, this lynch mob that's going to come after him. You've got the good versus the evil. It says, when they heard these things, what things? It could just be these last three verses that we just read. This direct attack. I would say it's probably referring to this whole message that he's brought forward. They've heard that they're guilty. They've heard, they, they, they've heard where they have failed God. And so what does it do? It says it cut them to the heart. It cut them to the heart. That literally means sawn in two. Stephen opened them up and he exposed what was really there. They were totally open. He showed them this is the condition of your hearts. He's showing them their hypocrisy. This is the only time this word is used. But there's a similar word used. Back in chapter 2 and verse 37, the phrase, the, the word that's used is pricked. That's our word that we have. It's pricked. These men have had their sin exposed. That's a good thing. It's good for us to have our sin exposed so we can deal with it. But the, the having it exposed is not the issue. It's what are you going to do with having it exposed? What do you do when your sin is opened up to you? Well, here, what they did was they got angry. If you look back, you don't need to turn there. But in, in the passage in, in Acts 2.37, they asked this question, what shall we do? What do we do? We've got this sin problem. Here's what they're saying. We repent. We need what you're offering. We need salvation. So having the sin exposed, that's not the big deal. Here, the problem is they respond totally with anger. They have their sin exposed and they are ticked off. We see their, we just see this total frustration. This phrase that's used, they gnash on him with their teeth. In secular writings, that phrase is used of an animal that's out of control. An animal that, whether it's angry or vicious, it, it tears the flesh of something else because it's got, it's just out of control. That's, the word, that's how this word is used in, in other places outside of Scripture. So they're angry. And it, it's interesting, too, that the, the, word, uh, the word here that we have, that they gnashed on him with their teeth. That phrase gets used to describe people in hell. Now that's a little confusing. Because if you just stop and think about it, when I think of people in hell, Revelation says, says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I understand the weeping. I understand that one day, if, if, if people are in hell, they're going to look back and think, oh, my, why didn't I respond? Why didn't I follow Jesus in this short little time frame that I had? Why didn't I receive him? Why didn't I follow him? There's going to be this regret. There's going to be weeping. But it doesn't say, the scripture doesn't say, one day there's going to be weeping, period. There's going to be weeping and this gnashing of teeth. The weeping is part of it. But for whatever reason, and I, I guess you can kind of see it as well, but there you're going to be filled. When people are in hell, they're going to be filled with rage. There's going to be an anger against God. Maybe, you know, why did you allow me to come here? Why did you? But there's going to be this constant anger. I don't know about you, but when I am angry, I really look forward to having that gone. I'm not a happy person, and nobody around me is happy. When I'm angry, it's not a good thing. They're going to live in an eternity of regret and anger all mixed together. There's going to be this anger that they have, and that's what's happening. 
in the life of these people. Now, we're going to see that on this earth, too, because it's an unseen. We won't see that. In the end times, we're told that when the plagues come, remember there's that gnashing of, there's that, they're, they're cursed God. They're going to know God is doing it. It's an interesting thing. They're going to know the scriptures. They're going to know, oh, this thing is coming. This is a judgment from God. And rather than repent, they're going to blame God. They're going to be angry with God. We're going to see that this anger just keeps coming up. So these people, they have the truth. They reject it. How, how does all of this part apply to us? Can I encourage you with this? As you hear the truth, get this. As you hear the truth, Stop pushing it off. Respond to the truth of God's word. Stop hardening yourself against his word. As the Holy Spirit reveals to you your need of salvation, you need to respond. You need to receive him. And Christian, when we're convicted, when we know that we've done wrong, Let's not grieve our Lord. Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit by not repenting. You and I need to respond humbly, and we need to keep our fellowship with our Lord open. That's where your joy is going to come from. We end up believing the lie that I'm going to get my happiness by doing the things I like to do and living for the things this world has to offer. It'll be temporary. But if you want joy that comes from God, it's going to come from following. Point B, God's reassurance. Verse 55, but he, okay, so now we've got another contrast. We've got this word, but, so we know it's a contrast. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So, now we're going to contrast what it is to be these people filled with wrath to Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost. And I like the way, I, I appreciate there's one word in here that I, I glanced over at first, but he being full. He was being full. See, Stephen did not go into a hard time in his life and all of a sudden, poof, he got full. He, he was just controlled by the Lord. He was in this state. That's what the being is. He was in a state of being full. It was his manner of life. That is how Stephen lived. Okay, you realize that should describe you and me? We are not to be, we shouldn't be just expecting, oh, one day when I need it, God's going to come up and, and just give me what I need to, to, to live for him. You, know, you need to be doing it now. I was talking with someone recently and I was explaining to them, because they, they made this comment, you know, I want to be at this point one day. I want to be living for the Lord one day. I want to be active one day. And my comment to them was, you need to make your next decision the right one. You need to be walk, take these baby steps, do the right thing next. And if we'll take the right steps, the path is going to lead where it needs to lead. That part's going to take care of itself. You and I need to be faithful to God now. That's what Stephen's life was characterized by. He walked with the Lord on a consistent basis, not just occasionally yielding. That's where we need to be. And he looked up steadfastly into heaven. That word steadfastly, that's the one, we've seen this word before. Before we saw it as a negative, now it's used as positive. You remember when they were judging Stephen and they were all gazing on him intently? That's the word we have here. They were focused on him. They were glaring at him. They wouldn't take their gaze off of him. And now we have the same word used in the positive sense. He wouldn't take his eyes off of the glory that he was receiving. So they look with hate. Stephen is looking with awe. So what does he see? We see, first of all, we're going to take these two verses together. He said, behold, behold. Okay, here's, what, here's what he's saying. Wow, this is awesome. That's behold. He is psyched about what he is seeing. It is an exciting thing. It's an awesome thing. And what is it that he sees and expresses? He saw the heavens open. I don't know how that worked. I don't understand what, you know, exactly what God allowed, but he was able to see the heavens open up. 
And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, that place of honor, that place of authority. All of these people around him, they've got spiritual blindness. Stephen, he has spiritual sight. And notice the word that he uses. And this has been brought up many times, is the idea that Jesus was standing. He was standing at the right hand. Back in Psalm 110, the first verse says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Normally, when it's quoted in the New Testament, that verse, and it's quoted fairly often, when that verse is quoted, it's the idea of sitting. His work is done. He's been elevated. He is reigning. He is ruling. He's where he needs to be. I think this is the only time we see him standing. And the question has come up, why? I, I'm going to guess and say he's very well welcoming Stephen because Stephen has done a really good job. Stephen has been a faithful man. It's like saying, good job, Stephen, come on home. He's honoring what Stephen has done as a good possibility. When Jesus, this phrase that he uses, the son of man, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing. That was Jesus' favorite term to use for himself. And he's referring back to Daniel 7. He's looking at uh, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. And Jesus used that. You remember when he's talking to Caiaphas, that's in Matthew 26, 63 and 64. Caiaphas said, tell us, tell us plainly, are you Messiah? And Jesus said, you said it. You said it yourself. In other words, I am the Messiah, and you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. You're going to see me coming. You're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. And what did Caiaphas do? Why do we need any more witnesses? You have spoken blasphemy. They understood that. They understood this claim. They understood that he was saying he was Messiah. He was deity. Today, people are kind of on the opposite side. Well, can you prove to me just by this little phrase that he's saying he's Messiah? They got it. People will excuse it today, but they understood who he was. And it was really, in a sense, it's like the final nail in Jesus' coffin. That was his blasphemy charge. That's where they said, you're guilty. You're done. Okay. How does this apply to us? If you and I will live for our Lord, we may not see the heavens open. We may not get this vision of God in all his glory. We may not see that, that, that Shekinah glory. That's what he was talking about when he said he looked up and he saw that, um, I just lost my place. Hold tight. Steadfastly, he saw the glory of God, verse 55. Remember back in verse 2, he called him the God of glory. Now he's talking about the glory of God. He saw that Shekinah glory. He saw how great God was visually. You and I may not be able to see that when we go. I understand this. Most likely you won't. But let me tell you what this is. This is a good reminder for you and I. We need to be constantly yielded to the Holy Ghost leading our lives. We need this. And if we expect to see God's blessing. If we expect to see God working in ways that we really desire to see him doing, we need to be walking with him. He can use whoever he wants. He can use us regardless of what we're doing. I want to be a part of his plan. I don't want him to have to work in spite of me like he does so often. I want him to work through me and use me as I'm walking with him. And he wants to do this. He wants us to be constantly yielded to him. And as you and I, and this is going to happen, as we're attacked, as we go through difficult times, as we have troubles in our lives, just like Stephen, we've got every right to look to heaven. We've got every right to be able to say, you know, God, again, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. It's going to be a natural thing for us to call on him in the day of trouble, Psalm 50, 15. It's going to be a natural thing for us to, to draw near to the throne of grace with confidence, to find mercy and grace, to help in time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. Our submission to the word of God, it needs to be a lifestyle, not something we tack on when we think about it. A good prayer for us today. Lord, help me remember 
Help me remember to yield to you. Help me remember all during the day. To help me keep remembering to yield in every moment and allow me to glorify you with my life. That is a prayer that God desires to hear. He wants us desiring to glorify him. Point C, the Jews' reaction. Verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice. We've used that, seen that, that phrase before, the loud voice is we, where we get our word megaphone from. They cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord. Okay, here's what it, this is saying. These adult men had a temper tantrum. They got ticked off. Have you ever seen kids do this? I mean, I remember this in school. They, they don't want to hear something that you're saying, so they'll plug their ears and go, la, 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 la. They can't hear what you're saying. I had somebody telling me about an adult. I mean, this is recent. An adult that didn't want to hear something from a political conversation, so they put their fingers in their ears and went, la, 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 la. An adult. People, this is childish. These are a bunch of immature people who totally lost control. And here's what they're doing. They were willfully, they're willfully refusing the truth. They want to believe what they want to believe. I want to do it my way. Don't you tell me anything different. Or I'll la, 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 you. Spoiled brats. Do you sense my frustration with this, the, the immaturity? Hey, listen, sense it because people, we can do this. We can have our own little temper tantrums and do our la la la's, and I'm not going to listen to what anybody has to say. Shame on me when I do this. We need to be teachable. And it says here, again, verse 57, they cried out with this loud voice, stopped their ears, and they ran upon him. They, they rushed him. Now, that's the same word that's used. Remember when Jesus was on the mountain and he cast out the demons out of the maniac? And the demon said, no, 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 at least let us go into these pigs. And Jesus said, okay, go into the pigs. And what do the pigs do? They rush down. There's our word. They rush down. Same word here, ran upon him. They rush down and they drown. Kind of interesting that you know, the same word will get used for demon possession as it would for these guys. So why are they so incensed? If this vision that he just had is true, if he did see Jesus standing on the right, on, on the place of honor with God, if this is a true statement, then they're guilty. They've got a problem. And they don't like that. But if it's false then he's guilty of blasphemy. So they're going to believe that song. They want to believe what they want to believe to make themselves come up right. So what happens? Verse 58. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen. Let's just stop right there for a second. So they lose this control, and, and what ends up happening the, they follow the law, and that's kind of ironic. They want to follow the law, so they take him outside of the camp, outside of the city, and that's where they're going to do their stoning him. The words, though, that's used, when it says they stoned him, they just kept on stoning him. Everybody just started tossing rocks. Everybody's in on this, but there's a way this was supposed to be done. Now, Deuteronomy 17.7 says they were to do this to purge evil out. When you got the evil purging out the righteous. And they did it, what they did was a wrong way. What they were supposed to do when you stoned them was you're supposed to throw them off this little precipice, like a 10, 12 foot cliff. If that kills the person, done. Everything's good. If that doesn't kill them, they were supposed to take a large stone, one of the witnesses, and throw it on their chest. If that kills them, good. You go home. And if that doesn't kill them, everybody starts throwing stones. They are in such a lynch mob mentality. They just skip what the protocol was and everybody starts pelting Stephen with these stones. Now we're going we're gonna to come back to that stoning in just a second because what happens here in verse 58 is there's this little interlude. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. 
Here's our introduction. Here is where the emphasis shifts. We have Saul being brought in, and this is the moment. This is a big moment in the book of Acts because what's happening is God is shifting his emphasis from Israel and he's shifting it to the Gentiles. And it's a slow process, so to speak, but that emphasis, this is the point where the, the, the drive for the Gentiles is starting and God pulls away from Israel as a group. Is he still, are we still seeing Jews say today? Yes, we are. But as a group, God has pulled away from Israel for now, and that's coming back. And he's starting, he's put his emphasis starting here onto Gentiles. So what do we see? Here you have, the wrath of man. And we know from scripture, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Jesus has worked with these people. Jesus has drawn these people. And I really appreciate Stephen. Stephen lived his life, and used this phrase, he's lived his life in such a way as to invite persecution. People, if we're not doing that, we're messing up. We need to live our lives in such a way that we are walking with our Lord. And as people resist the Lord, as people resist his drawing, as people resist his conviction, our God can pull away from them. Our God can resist and harden them. This is a serious thing. We need to respond. And Christians... As we resist him, do as we grieve him. We are grieving our Lord as we resist him. We can break and damage our fellowship. We can lose his blessing that he desires to have in our lives. You and I need to respond to him. That brings us to our last point. Stephen's Christ-like response. And they stoned Stephen. Okay, they continued stoning him. They kept up stoning him. They just wouldn't stop. And Stephen was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. When he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, same words used up in verse 57, that megaphone, he cried out loudly, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I can remember telling the boys when I coached, when I helped coach basketball, uh, phrases like, leave it on the court, leave it all on the court. If you're down by 20, you don't quit with a minute to go. Let's make it down by 15. You keep fighting to the very end. You never stop. You keep pushing. And I pushed that, 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 that phrase on, the, on, on those boys to never stop the fight. You got to keep fighting. I want to suggest here that what, what Stephen did, Stephen went down praying. He was praying to the very end. What better way to meet Jesus? That's what he was doing. He was praying. He was ready. And, and notice the similarities of what we just read. When we look at Jesus versus, versus Stephen, Jesus said, I commit my spirit to God. Stephen said, receive my spirit. Jesus cried with a loud voice forgive them they don't know what they do Stephen cried with a loud voice lay not the sin to their charge afterwards Jesus gave up the ghost Stephen afterwards fell asleep a lot of similarities Stephen did a really he was a faithful man he's a good example for you and I to desire to follow notice he said here Lord Jesus receive my spirit that word for, for the receive is the idea of you know lay off the welcome mat welcome me home he wants it to be a joyful thing he's ready and and, and you notice too he's saying receive my spirit it's going to be an immediate thing there is no purgatory there's no soul sleep there's nothing that's going to happen we die and this, really death is part of life we're going through this life, death happens, and you continue one place or the other. Either you're in heaven with the Lord, to be absent from the body, is present with him, or you're going to be absent from him for the rest of your life, or the rest of, rest of eternity. 
you're going to go to one place or another. And that is, that's part of what he's implying here with this receive my spirit. It's going somewhere, so receive it. And I like the fact that as they're stoning him, they're in the process of stoning him, Stephen kneels down and he prays for them, the, one, the murderers who are stoning him. He prays for them and he does it with a loud voice. He wants them to hear what he's saying. And he prays, don't lay this sin to their charge. I admire Stephen. I don't, I don't know how quick I could come up with, Lord, these guys are stoning me right now. Would you please bless them? I would want that retribution in my flesh. I'm going to want a lot of bad things to be happening to people. Stephen, he had the mind of Christ in him. He was walking with the Lord. How did he do this? Well, let me just say this. Don't assume you're going to get ready at death. Don't assume that this special grace is going to come over us when we're ready to die. And all of a sudden, these years of serving flesh and these years of serving self, it's just going to all be done away with. And all of a sudden, I can serve God. And everything's going to be made right. This was Stephen's lifestyle. This is how he lived. This is how you and I need to commit to start living or continue living today. We need to have this mentality in us and care about those who hate us. Care about those that Jesus loves and wants to see coming to him. We need to be asking God to give us this. Stephen, we're told, fell asleep only to wake up with his Lord. And I fell asleep last night. And I woke up this morning. I didn't cease to exist when I fell asleep. My existence kept going. That's what happens when we die. Our existence just keeps on going. We'll still be alive. We're going to be in one place or another. Stephen, I don't think he really knew the impact that he was going to have on people's lives. Stephen had an impact on Saul. Paul mentions him several times in his writings. He had an impact on Paul's life. He's having an impact on lives of people today as Luke has recorded what he said. People, we may never know how God uses you and me. We may never have any idea of how he can use us. So can I just encourage you with this? Let's, let's, let's commit to being faithful. Let's give, let's give God good ammunition to work with, so to speak. Let's be faithful to him, and let's just trust God with the outcome. Whether we know how it comes out or not, it's irrelevant. You and I need to be faithful. I think most of us underestimate how greatly God can use us. Because he can. And he delights to use us. Let's be faithful to him to walk in the power of his Holy Spirit. Stephen had this great mix. He had a boldness. He had a love about him. That he felt those that he, that he witnessed to. But the key to his ministry was that he desired to be like Jesus. And you and I need that same passion. As we do that, we'll bring glory to God. We'll stand for a moment. If you're here today and you've never become a follower of Jesus, you are just as needy as these Jewish leaders were. You're hopeless without Jesus, and you need to be forgiven. That's the need you're in today. Those who come to Jesus will not be turned away. I would love nothing more today. If you're not sure that you have that relationship, I'd love nothing more than to help you with that. Please, when Bethany plays, come talk to me. Talk to me after, but don't leave here without dealing with your sin and your need to be forgiven. Christian, I think I'm safe to say that you and I, we need to get more serious about living our lives in the power of God. We need to be more serious about walking in such a way that we invite persecution. God can use us in ways that we never thought possible. Let's open ourselves up to that. And let's live our lives to bring glory to him. You do business with God.
as he leads.